Brooke Williams, so good to see you. Thank so you. So great to be here. Thanks for coming down here to Oak Spring. Well, now that I'm here, I would not have missed it. Good. Yeah. I'm delighted. Yeah. I'm delighted. Well, you've been working for a lifetime on issues that we all care about. The West, conservation issues there, seeing nature right in front of you, experiencing, resonating with it. So I'd love to begin with this beautiful paper that you've written for this conference um, on dragonflies and give us a feel for how mesmerizing they are and how you got into that. Um, in the paper, I describe <clears throat> having a dream like 15 years ago where dra a dragonfly was in that dream. And from then on, dragonflies have just appeared to me and they've been everywhere. And at that moment, um, when I had the dream, right after it, I noticed I was at a conference, not unlike this, in a completely different place. But um, I noticed right after it, there was a small group of dragonflies flying around these reeds at this, in this pond. And I said to the woman next to me, I can't believe it. Look how beautiful those dragonflies are. And she said, what? We've been here all week. They've been here all week. You haven't noticed? And from then on, they just started appearing to me. So I started paying attention. And I looked at them, kept notes um, of my encounters, I think it's 15 years, and try to, to look at them from the perspective of their ecology and the story that I, that I had with, that went along with them, but also their archetypal meaning. Mm -hmm. And what that's led to, for me, is this idea that there's a whole piece of, of the discussion that's been missing. Mm -hmm. And that's this sort of inner world that we all live with. You know, Jung would call it the collective unconscious. Mm -hmm. A lot of people call it the inner world. Um, a lot of people believe that it's only been separated from the outer world in the last 10 or 12,000 years, that before that it was all, we were integrated. Mm -hmm. um, that this collective unconscious may be the entire evolutionary history of our species including all the tools we ever needed to save ourselves. Mm -hmm. And if we either ignore it or don't believe it's there or don't make use of it at a time like this, you know, what good are we? Mm -hmm. So the big question I have is how to sort of, I don't want to use the word institutionalize, but I will, institutionalize it as a valuable source of knowledge mm -hmm. along with everything else. So with dragonflies, what I hope to do I'm trying to turn it into a book. And what I hope to do is to sort of demonstrate with my own story that everyone has this similar story and that these creatures, I mean, isn't that amazing that what um, the symbolic and archetypal meaning of a creature is based on its natural history? Mm -hmm. I mean, that to me is so, so obvious, but it's so interesting, don't mm -hmm. you think? Totally. Yeah. And so... I have these questions about how we start to see that and, and to make special use of that other knowledge that we've kind of ignored. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. And you've been doing this for so long with such insight and clarity in these places in the West. And um, I know you want to especially talk about issues in Utah. And maybe you want to tell us about these graphs that you've been thinking about. Well... Um, these hockey stick graphs and, you know, the, the main one we've all seen, I'll never forget um, um, in the first uh, movie of the vice president where he gets on the, um, the lift to, to show the graph how our CO2 emissions have gone along like this for like 400,000 years. And then all of a sudden they go like this. And remember, he has to get in the forklift. Right. Gore. Al, Al, Gore. Al Gore gets yeah. in the forklift to go to the top to show you how it's changed. Yeah. And they call that the hockey stick graph. Right. And I was thinking about it because I saw another hockey stick graph. And that, that was of the number of visitors that are going to Zion National Park. That it's gone along like this for years and then now it's like off the charts. They don't know what to do with all these people. Mm. Um, it's a very small park and it gets as many visitors as Yellowstone, four million a year. Mm. Now they're thinking, all right, we've got to have reservations or whatever. And it's, it's so crowded that you might not have the experience. I would not have the experience that I was a park ranger there back in the 70s. It's totally different now. Mm. But people just are flocking to these wild places. Mm. And then I saw another hockey stick graph, which was the number of suicides for 
young adults in Utah. And so I think, how are those three graphs related? Mm -hmm. On one hand, I think the fact that the climate change is happening and that um, nobody in the government wants to do much about it. And I think there are so many people out there that unconsciously, based on the the politics of today, want to go somewhere that's real. Mm -hmm. They want to experience something that's that's true. And that, you know, truth, the basic truth as I see it is what the natural world has to offer us. Mm -hmm. And then the kids killing themselves, it's like, what's the future? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that has a lot to do with it. There's other implicate. There's other things implicated in Utah with, you know, the, um, the whole thing with LGBT kids and the way they're accepted or not by their families, especially because the Mormon church has very antiquated ideas about that. Mm -hmm. But I think all those three graphs are related. Yeah. Well, this is so important, I think, for us to connect the dots as, you, as you're doing, and unusual dots in a certain way. But I am also deeply moved and disturbed by our next generation and the suicide rate, the lack of hope, the sense of being disembodied and disempowered. Mm -hmm. What can they do, as you've said? And in teaching, you know, I feel yeah. this a lot. So give us a sense of... We're, we're trying to connect the dots, but we're also trying to say between the horrors we're facing, the beauty of the natural world, and our own despair, how can we shift this? Where, where's, where are the vectors of openings? You know, one thing I think about a lot is that the beauty of the natural world, I think, is so important. And I really believe that therein lies the answer. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not only the beauty, but just the intricacies and the way it works. And what was it Leopold that said very succinctly, a thing is right as long as it um, does not harm the natural system and it's wrong when it does. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd really way over paraphrase that, but that's right and wrong. I mean, now we're, we are surrounded by every day there's no real hard definition of what's right or what's wrong anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think this is so frustrating to young people on one hand. On the other hand, there's this giant flow of people into these the few remaining wild places that we have. Mm -hmm. And um, what I really believe is that it's all around us all the time mm -hmm. if we pay attention. And how can we, as an older generation... Let these younger people know that, look, this is something that you can have every day. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter where you are at any place at any time. It's all around us. And I think it's healing. And it's not only healing, but it's informative. And I really firmly believe that we spend enough time uh, contemplatively out in, in these wild places or even surrounded by the nature that we are able to pay attention to no matter where it is. And, you know, we get a sense of how the planet might make the best use of us. I, yeah. I, I really believe that. It's like a biological thing. We are biological organisms that want our species to survive. Yeah. And how do we tap into that energy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just give a very quick response to that beautiful comment. I was sitting there this morning meditating, thinking about this conference. Very, very quiet. And all of a sudden this bird outside the window, you know, was just singing, singing, singing. So this sense that we're all working towards and have felt for a long time and coming together to network this sensibility is how can we listen, be attuned, and realize, as you've just said, this healing dimension yeah. of the earth that's speaking to us. Yeah. Well, and it's like I mentioned with dragonflies. Before that dream, I know I saw them. Because I was a field biologist. I knew, I knew that there were places where I, they must have just come into my view, but I never, they didn't register mm -hmm. in, my, in my memory. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you were meditating and that bird came, um, you may say, well, because I was meditating, that bird came. But no, because you were meditating, you were attentive to the mm -hmm. bird. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what are we missing mm -hmm. that has information for us? Yeah, yeah exactly. And... I also like that you just said, because I'm from New York, and New York to me has two rivers on two sides of Manhattan. It's rock, you know, it's granite, it's schist, it's very powerful, mm -hmm. Central Park in the middle. So I also think, and just want to draw it from you, 
even though you've lived in some of those beautiful wild places this country has to offer. But I do think we can feel the dimensions of wind, trees, etc. No yeah, matter where we no are. No matter where we are. You know, and I love that idea of just attention. Yeah. You know, um, and I love the idea that to paying attention to what attracts your attention. Mm -hmm. But it all still requires that we cannot be constantly, I mean, walking through the airport today, you kind of have to have a helmet on <laughs> because people are on their phones yeah. walk, just walking and you don't want to run into people. Yeah. But I think that's a, like a plot yeah. to absorb our attention into mm -hmm. something that for the corporations is productive. If we're just out like randomly with these divergent views, wondering what is going to attract our attention, yeah. no, this is this attracts our attention, yes. and not only that, but it can sell us something and do some good yeah. as opposed to just you wasting all that free time you have. Yeah, you know, yeah. and also it can create a sense of more needs and needs and wants and right. desires apart from what's feeding us all the time exactly yeah yeah and all these elements are feeding us yes constantly and when you think about our ancestors i mean for how many hundred thousand years did that was that all we had yeah that you know that exposure to this natural system that was just kind of whirring along and we were a piece of it yeah and the information i think about the stars a lot because what did I read the other day that 10% of the population can even see the Milky Way anymore because so much concentration in cities where there's so much light. And then you think about it, for how many hundred thousand years did we sit around at night and that's all we did. Yeah. But look at the stars. Yeah, yeah. What, and, what's up there? Yeah, exactly. And you have been fortunate to be exposed to that over and over again. And then the working through the desert. I mean, again, the places that you've dwelled in. These are places that in many traditions, religious traditions, gave rise yes. to profound... I mean, can't they say, you, you know this, can't they say that if you really look at religion and the history of all religion, a lot of it is, the root, is rooted in these desert, the desert fathers, these hermits. You know, and um, I was, because we're at the Harvard Divinity School, I've talked to people about this, and the people study this, you know, and they've written books about it. And I kept, I say to myself, if it worked then, why doesn't it work now? Mm -hmm. I mean, why wouldn't it? Yeah. Doesn't it make sense? Yes. Even, I mean, we know so much more, but still there's that elemental kind of spiritual connection we have to those kinds of places. Yes. Yeah. Which is, as you've said, why people are seeking them yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. And I think um, to just affirm that as a new mode of, a new and ancient way of being human um, that has real potential for redirecting our frenetic, mm -hmm. distracted <laughs> cell phone world, mm -hmm. right? Oh, yeah. I, w I would love to be able to say that within the next couple of decades, it will be a requirement. Mm -hmm. You know, corporations, you know, political people will be required to go out and wander around by themselves for a few days. Yeah. Or being taken by a naturalist. Yeah. That's or it. at least be got, have, somebody, have somebody so you don't hurt yourself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But a naturalist would be good, too. Yeah. Um, but just being out, too. Yes. Is... We just have no clue what's really happening to us when we're out there. Like, yeah. I read the other day where every time you step in on a, on a piece, on, a, on the forest... These microorganisms are released, and you breathe them in without even knowing it, and they are beneficial to you. Yeah. yeah. You know? And forest, you don't even see it. Forest bathing yeah. and so on that they're yeah. speaking about now. Yeah. 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 Well, we're going to wind this up, but by saying John and I were just, as you know, uh, in southern Utah and then visiting you and Terry and having an amazing connection there. But I think... The places where you have dwelled, where you have uh, grown up for so long, but also have been heroically trying to save, um, are some of the most extraordinary places on the planet. And by being close to that, you bring this back to all of us. Well, and you make a really good point that those places are all being threatened, many of them, and I think 
the, the, what I grew up with is these these places all have these intrinsic values, yeah. and we need to save them for that, whether or not we ever find any value for us. But I think it's time that we finally realize that it, it has this value for us. Yes. And it's not something you buy or sell. Yes. But it's this deep spiritual connection to a place and also to our own evolutionary success. It's all the same. Yes, that's beautiful. Because um, certainly you feel deep time there. Yeah. The journey of the universe is patterned there. Yeah. And the stones and the rocks yeah. and so on. So thank you so much, Brooke. Thank you. This is great.